I think they're having a laugh here. I, I don't think that this is anywhere near a three grand watch. I, I, I think that it's, I, I, I cannot justify any part of this to be three grand, not even half that. I mean, you can buy a full titanium watch from Citizen with a titanium bracelet and stuff for a grand. So this is three times that, for what? You know, and it's a rubber strap that you have to cut. I mean, that, that is also a joke, I think, in 2024. It should not exist. Um, so this was three grand. I, I think they're having a laugh here. Greetings and welcome to this week's uh, blog to watch weekly. We are but four people again. Phone? Phone? Four. Four lonely watch geeks wandering through the universe on the back of a turtles. It's turtles all the way down this morning. Or maybe it's Rolex is all the way down. <laughs> or it is from Ariel, which is the first article we're going to talk about is all about future watch trends. So maybe it's tech all the way down. But let's say good morning to everybody first. Ripley, just getting you just as you're taking a sip there, just unprepped. We have you on camera, the what the great wall of Ripley is back. Yes, it's back. It's a, it's daytime <laughs> in the cave, so we're we're in full light <laughs> light again. Uh it, 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 it's good yes and it, but although it is raining again so there, there's that i mean if you stretch your arms out further than the image that i can see is is it like something else is it like just a placed perfect wall right in your camera position and the other side it's like linoleum and plastic and carpet and things or is it walls all the way down it's a very elaborate wallpaper. It that, that <laughs> From the 3D printed wallpaper. Yeah. Great stuff, David. How are you this morning? I'm I'm very well, <laughs> David. I'm speaking. You're in a hotel, I think. Are you 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 somewhere remote? Yeah, well, not too remote, but it's just a little um thing that was happening last night, and um, you know today I'm back, so that's that's easy easy, and hopefully the internet is stable. Apparently, it is. For a whopping sum of eighty euros, I mean, not for the internet, but for the for the room included. So, so we're on eighty impressed. euro internet for David. Let's see how that goes. Ariel, you two are also traveling. I think your internet looks slightly more than eighty euros, though. I have to say, I am in a large American hotel uh, room. Nothing like traveling in Middle America <laughs> to realize how wonderful space is. <laughs> <laughs> cheap and big space everywhere. Where about in Middle America? Are I'm, you? I'm in Dallas, Texas. Intersections as far as the eye can see. <laughs> Roundabouts no, all no, the way down. Not round. You, you for should see the, uh, school bright here. the intersections. No roundabouts. Here. They're the most confusing <laughs> things you've ever seen. Look on Google Maps when you're like going directions. You're like, how is it in one <laughs> map screen that there's like 40 roads? <laughs> <laughs> I, I ever watched the guy on Instagram that does the geo finding stuff? What does he do? You ever come across him? He he get he gets Google. I gets Google Maps to drop him anywhere in the world, and in ten seconds he guesses where he is just by looking at Google yeah. Maps. I mean, it's, it's remarkable. We'll stick it in the show notes. <laughs> It's like we think we're in some sort of geek subculture and watches. You should see these guys. You know, there's a, there's a, there's always that's, a that's there's always a bigger more geek useful than, you. than playing Tetris for a long time. <laughs> slightly, <laughs> well, I don't know. I quite like Tetris. Anyway, let's uh, get on with the show. First up, Ariel. A future where technology companies buy up old watch brands. A couple of weeks ago, we spoke about which. Uh, designs of watches should be removed from their existing brand and given to another. So I want to know first up which watch brand should be given to which tech company as part yeah. of your thing. Who did you imagine would one day buy Patek or Breitling? Well, that's that's the beauty. You know, you never really know. This is what I knew going into the article that. A lot of watch brands today, similar to how they did in the past, will, I don't want to say die, but we're going to use the word hibernation or go into uh, undead mode, where the <laughs> name still has value, but uh, its life force has been drained away. And we've had resurrections over time. We've had a lot of resurrections. I think one of the most famous resurrections was that of Breguet, right, which was totally dead. And came back through um, a private investment firm, which was, you know, it was later purchased by the Swatch Group. But that is a famous resurrection. And they hired Daniel Roth and be like, oh, hey, let's, uh, you know, let's figure out what a Breguet wristwatch today would look like. And that's Breguet. It's a, it's a modern invention. Um, but if that happened 40, 50 years from now, maybe it wouldn't necessarily come back as 
a mechanical watch company because there's all these tech companies that are going to be making wearables, but as we know, tech companies don't design things, they make tech. So the idea of a old-fashioned brand, which is a watch brand, merging with a wearable tech device seems to make sense when we want to look classy. So yes, I can see Patek Philippe dying and maybe coming back as a smartwatch or something like that, you know, because in the future, there's going to be a lot more than just wristwatch uh, technology wearables. We're going to have eyeglasses. We're going to have brooches. We're going to have all kinds of stuff. I don't know why old names that were good at those things uh, come back. You know, I think we're going to have a lot of eyeglass uh, where brands die and come back as a tech company. So, um, you know, Zenith, for example, was basically part of a tech company for a while, right? And then it went off to being, you know, just watchmaking. So we've had a lot of permutations of stuff like this in the past. We've had watchmakers combined with, you know, dial makers. And then that's how, you know, Jager Le Colt comes about. So I don't think it's completely out of the question that something like this could happen. Of course, it's it's really not a matter of what brand, but what's available. Because there'll be a tech company be like, guys, we can't make good looking watches to save our life, even though we have great tech, you know, what, what designs do we buy? You know, how do we build a whole brand around this? And this goes to the idea of why somebody chooses your wearable versus someone else's. And we already see that in the still nascent area of smartwatches. Um, it's like Apple watch and the alternatives, <laughs> right? And why you would wear one over another. It's very difficult for companies to decide a lot, of it, a lot of it has to do with, I'm sorry, for consumers to decide, a lot of it has to do with aesthetics. So um, going into an era where mechanical watchmaking is probably going to be more and more niche in terms of the amount of people that make it and that these brands are going to die in the future, who's going to make use of these brands? And I think a lot of it's going to be tech companies. So that's the basic premise. So how, I mean, if I think of the business I uh work with then we have been around for 50 years but when i look at the businesses that were around 50 years ago when we started out most of them are gone and i think your premise is there's no reason to suspect that just because they're got fans that make podcasts about them that the watch industry should be any different and that it shouldn't also be cyclical cyclical that uh, a number of these brands will will fade over years and that just because we've got them now doesn't mean we'll always have them. If anything, that's how we get comebacks, mm. you know? We're not going to have a great Gerard Perrigo unless the one today maybe dies, is yeah. the point. Not that the one today is bad, but if if you want it to be better, you have to kill half these brands first. Yeah, I mean, is, is, the, is it like there's only so much room for so many big brands and that there, there can be nobody else appear in the scene. So, I don't know, pick a brand, uh, Monta, no, you know, Fears, Moser are never going to become the size of a Breitling or a Patek unless something the size of Breitling or a Patek eventually passes on somehow or disappears in a cloud of smoke to make room. So there can only be, it's like a pyramid, there can only be so many companies of a certain scale with some kind of economic laws that exist here unless the population expands more There's rapidly. There's a very real market cap mm. to the watch industry. And also, look at how many watch brands died in the 1960s mm. and 1970s that popped up in the last couple of years as a Kickstarter brand. Mm. A ton. Mm. You know, the Kickstarter of tomorrow needs new names. So watch brands, if things aren't going well, just Give your name to history. <laughs> so is it like the uh, apocalypse, you know, the death of the dinosaurs? We're, we're due a meteorite strike because we haven't had one for 65 million years. And that, uh, you know, we haven't had a watch crash since the 1960s and we're kind of due one for whatever reason. David, do we think there's, there's should, we, should we be saying the end of the watch world is nigh? Well, if you want clicks, we should, but... <laughs> Um, other than that, I don't. I don't think it's. Uh, I never understood this anticipation for a meteorite or something like that, just because it does not happen. You know, we have sixty-five million uh, reasons to think that it will not happen. The sixty-five million first year, right? So it's like, sure, yeah, but I understand that. You know, it's 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 good to contemplate these issues and stuff. Uh, I quite like the premise of Ario's article. I think that's that's a very exciting thing to uh, to think about and to entertain. 
Um, because who knows, you know, like uh, tech, tech companies have a very different approach um, to watches and watchmaking. Um, you know, if you look back at like Tag buying Coyer and, and the like, I think it's, it, it can always be very exciting. On the, on the flip side, sometimes watchmakers uh, create technology companies like Seiko did with Epson. So we've seen examples for that as well. Um, you know, Tag itself has been um, developing certain uh, manufacturing technologies, etc. So I think there's there's a lot of interesting mixes in between these very different disciplines. But no, to answer your question, I don't anticipate uh, something like that happening. Even though, yes, some brands would definitely uh, or could potentially benefit from a clean sheet. So Ripley, who who David's very optimistic that the world is not about to end, but Ripley, who who should we be lining up for? For an apocalypse, who would you take? Oh, you're a tech billionaire. Who do you want to buy? Well, obviously, I would want to buy the ones that don't want to be sold. Like, who wouldn't want to buy Rolex? Rolex will be buying my tech company, you know. So, like, that's Rolex isn't for sale. I don't think Patek's going to be up for sale. But I think for these other brands, like, think about how the mundane clock has proliferated like you look at the iphone clocks you look at like airport clocks they had to pay the uh, mundane a bunch of money um because apple like co-opted the mundane like clock for their own world time clock uh, app sure. in the app so uh i like if i was a brand who had a very recognizable uh dial or face or t- way of displaying the time um even something that is uh, you know, an, a unique analog display, like even the Jacques Edro, like the large second one. Talk about brands that are, phew, oh, I mean, kind of a pulse, a secondary pulse. I'm not, you know what I mean? That's a brand where I think there's a lot of interesting things that could be done in the tech realm with some of their longstanding designs and novelties, but not necessarily in a mechanical manner, or even just as a display for a smartwatch. Like if you were a, um, a smartwatch company and you wanted to make a bunch of displays for your Samsung, go buy a company like Singer for like the dial side type who has like all these great designs or buy a company that is known for having good dials and just port those all over on the digital side that you can go either sell for a buck a piece or, you know, just make for a better looking timepiece. But I would be, if I was any brand that had great dials and just weren't selling watches, I'd be thinking, well, yeah, Maybe we'll just be a digital thing now at this point. Licensing. David, did you you wanted some thinking time a couple of shows ago about uh, watches that should be removed from one brand and given to another? Did you come to any any other revelations? <laughs> yeah. No, I have not. To be to be brutally honest, I I I totally forgot about that uh, that <laughs> idea. Somehow it, it allowed me to sleep better because this can really like the <laughs> Uh, you know, twist my thoughts a little bit. Um, but, you know, thank you for reminding me. I will think of it um, for next week. How about that? Next week, David will not only wear a watch next week, because you can already see he's not wearing one, uh, he will also think of what watch company should uh, lose one of its uh, major major trademarks to another. Okay, let's look at... I don't think Patek should be making the Nautilus. You don't think about well, Technically, you celebrated I mean, it when they discontinued it. It just doesn't go with the brand. <laughs> yeah, but they're, they're obviously going to bring it back and, you know, more expensive, slightly tweaked form. So who should I'm make just saying, it next? It's really the odd man out. Anyone, you know. It's, it's screwing up their game. It makes it hard to sell the classic looking annual calendars that they make. Just, you know. I mean, what about a brand that's, I mean, you were talking about tech companies buying watch brands. You think there's ever any possibility that Something within a watch brand, let's say the Speedmaster, becomes so synonymous that they can actually sell the Speedmaster. They don't need to sell Omega, they just sell the Speedmaster. I suppose a bit like Breitling and, and uh, Zinn with a kind of Navi timer. You know, we need to make some money, we're going bust, so we're going to sell X, Y, and Z. Is there anybody big enough or small enough or owns? good enough IP that another brand would ever try not by the company, but the actual just design that has made them famous. Or, you know, a little brand, I'm trying to think, you know, I don't know, who's a wee brand? Bell & Ross? Bell & Ross, well known for Square Watch. They'd actually just buy that watch because, I don't know, Brightling want to make something. It's not worth support. anything. Just not worth anything. Because you can cop... No, it's legally it's not worth anything because here's the thing. It's not a copyrightable thing, so you don't have copyright protection. The only type of protection you have 
outside of a patent, which is relatively short, is trade dress. And for trade dress to apply, it has to be used in commerce. So if the original brand no longer does it, it's basically free for anyone to take. Interesting. So my Panerai safe, my little crown guard is is safe from those that want to. Yeah, it, it's 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 supposed to suggest origination, but if if it's known that Panerai is long gone and someone else is making it, no one thinks it came from Panerai. Same. I would just take the Nautilus and and give it to one of the homage brands. Just say, oh, finally, guys, we have it. It's it's that thing. I give it to Pagani Design or Women. Give it to Noon Official. Yeah, the yeah, Noon Official. <laughs> or, or the Submariner. Make the Submariner just open, open source or whatever they call it for watches. Yeah, you know? give Noon Official the Nautilus and just let them. You guys, you wanted it. You have it. Yes. Go forth and Nobody conquer. wants it anymore, though. <laughs> Give it to a whole country. I think Noon is out of like Bahrain or something. Give it to Bahrain. It's all theirs. Any company from that country that wants to make it yeah. is allowed to. I mean, if your Instagram out. account's anything like mine, then then you have like a thousand DMs from people whose names you can't pronounce normally because they're written in Chinese script uh, going, we, we make brilliant watches. Just pick one. Just go into your direct messages, Patek, and pick one of somebody that's offering you perfect watches. So I've thought about price. actually sending, they're like, we'll make whatever you want, whatever Franken you want. We copy whatever mm. Rolex. And I'm like, mm. what if I sent them the Moser like super Franken and just said, I want 500 of these. That's, that is my dream. You know how many times I've had to resist doing exactly that? Go and make me one of these. <laughs> Rick, sidebar later and we can kickstart that okay. one. <laughs> I, th- I think so because other than, yeah, let's go for it. We'll, we'll, we'll just get sued. We'll set up a wee company that's worth a pound in I don't know the Falkland Islands or something some of that's far out of reach are really expensive to appoint solicitors okay and we'll, we'll just do it from there but I think the well, Moser Franken so watch. all my all my colleagues are now going to be fugitives is that it <laughs> we can podcast from anywhere I, I I get marketed this thing where apparently I can go buy like a one like square foot of land in Scotland so I can be called a lord like legally or something like that. So we can just go base. I can go buy my plot in Scotland. We can go base the company out of my one square meter of land and then, you know, put a little PO box on it or something. <laughs> I already have one of those one square. So from now on, you can just call me Lord. Okay. Lord Rick. It's as simple as that. I have one of those Lord Rick. I have one of those one square meters of land in the Scottish <laughs> islands from, I think actually technically my mother was bought it. And so I had started to inherit the title at some stage. Yeah. So it would make, what is it when you're, so I would be, I would need to be called Esquire or something just now mm. until uh, until I, I I collect it in the inheritance. Has anyone got a square foot of the moon? Any any moon moon owners here? No, I don't that, have that. that. Actually I comes, think Omega owns it no, all. It, it comes in the <laughs> box of the next limited edition Speedmaster. You buy the Speedmaster, you get a square foot of the moon. Do you remember the April Fools where I had Omega send every watch they made to the moon? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All watches the, are now moon watches. But the question is, if you own a square foot of the moon and you can then now look at an Omega Speedmaster and they've got a laser ablated image of the moon and it happens to include part of the one square meter of moon that you own, can you so sue Omega for some sort of copyright theft. They've, they've, st- image, image theft. If you've got a picture, I own that bit of the moon, therefore I own the image of the moon and you're putting your watch, I'm going to, I'm going to sue you. It's a privacy issue. I'm against this lunar imperialism, <laughs> sir. <laughs> yeah, private, that's right. You've taken a photograph. To, you're drawing what my house looks like. <laughs> go away. Right, anyway, let's go. I don't even remember what we're talking about. <laughs> uh, welcome to the rabbit trail that is a block. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing matters. It's all just, it's all just, it's calling games. Bag of tail. Anyway, right. Casio G Shock. Okay, here we go. Tip deep breath. Casio G Shock MRGB 5000R 1 Cobarian Bezel Watch. At Ripley, you wrote the article about this. Tell us why we should care about this square G Shock. So they've done this before. I, I think these are really cool. So they, this is like the original Square G-Shock, you know, the original 1983 design, just done to the absolute tease. Uh, they've done this before in a couple different executions. One was all blacked out um, with a metal bracelet. They did a, a full silver one. Um, the whole point of these is to basically just do the original design of the watch and then do it 
all the way up to the nine. So this is one of the original variants, uh, the one rather than being the black one with the low red frame around the, the screen, this is like the black and gold one. Um, and what for this one, the concept was to really kind of more stick true to the original concept. So it's got a rubber strap rather than a bracelet. Uh, but I kind of like these because for the it's sort of the opposite of the moon swatch. And I say this in the article, like the moon swatch is kind of the watering down of this prestigious design into something that's commercially available at a lower level. And this is taking something that's literally the cheapest G-Shock you can buy at any given point in time as far as just design silhouettes, and then bringing it all the way up to the level of like entry level Omega price point. And so whether or not this is how you're going to want to spend your 3K, I kind of love that these exist because it's sort of like Casio saying, what if we just didn't want to make a $100 or $200 or $300 watch and wanted to make a $3,000 watch, but still to make the same watches, what would that look like? So they've got all the best tech. You know, They've got a bezel with the top part made of this exotic material called Cobarion. It's a really cool piece. Maybe not where I would spend my 3K, but it's a really cool piece. But it, have they made a? Th- that's my question. Have they made a three thousand dollar watch, or have they just charged three thousand dollars for exactly. a two hundred fifty dollar watch? No, that's that's a four thousand dollar watch without a bracelet. So now it's three thousand. <laughs> well, I guess it, it a bracelet is conversation from last so, week. So you know, it is all <laughs> titanium. If we, if we want to look at like what a brand's charging for a stainless steel sports watch with like an ETA based movement in it, or, or like let's not even get into David's uh, tag with that, you know, $900,000 like, yeah. price point or whatever, you know, like I, I think it's sort of like what the market will bear in certain degrees, but in, this is very much like, I think a niche product, a limited execution of what is, you know, it's not necessarily practical, but neither are like, you know, uh, your, $700 sneakers or whatever else people collect. So this is kind of within that same realm of like stealth wealth, but like on a very inside baseball level. One. Have we been able to determine if Cobarian is from the Star Trek or Star Wars universe? <laughs> uh, I thought it was just five. a... Babylon, Babylon 5. five. Yeah. five. No, 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 five. Right, right, right. I think you're having a laugh here. I, I don't think that this is anywhere near a three grand watch. I, I, I think that it's, I, I, I cannot justify any part of this to be three grand. Not even all of that. I mean, you can buy... A full titanium watch from Citizen with a titanium bracelet and stuff for a grand. So this is three times that for what? You know, and it's a rubber strap that you have to cut. I mean, that, that is also a joke, I think, in 2024. It should not exist. Um, the module looks very similar, actually more basic than what I have in my G Lite or Glide that costs $99. And it has, you know, the same multiband, six, the tough solar. It doesn't have Bluetooth, but who cares? Um, so this was three grand. I, I think they're having a laugh here. I mean, are the pushers gold? I don't think so. <laughs> and, 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 no, they are gold IP that. on the pushers. Mm. Well, so th- I'm not saying that this is necessarily <coughs> worth it, but I think mm. the the big undercut on this one is the standard, um, like the mid tier ones. So like that, the five six hundred dollar like full metal ones, where you do get Bluetooth, you do get multi band six. It is a different module. You don't get a gold plated movement. You know, or like screen holder, whatever that's on the, this one, but it's basically you get a lot of the same watch. You can get it with a strap or without it. You get a full metal construction. No, it's not titanium. It's steel. No, you don't get Kobari on. It's you know whatever. But I think at like you know four or five hundred dollars, that it's not a b- better watch, but it comes seventy five percent of the way for you know a fraction of the price. So I, I I think that's that's kind of the big undercut for these. There are people who simply can't leave the house without a watch that costs yeah, a few thousand dollars. True. Nothing touches my there skin needs but to gold. Be a, <laughs> there needs to be a Casio yeah. for them. Like I, respect, I, I agree. Respect I agree. And that's the target demographic here. But it's like they are looking at all these Excel sheets or some time and they realize that there's a three grand gap. And if there is like no bracelet and no whatever, and then this, this thing came to exist. But it did not exist for a reason, right? And I can justify the 5 and 6K G-Shocks very much because I feel like, okay, those are made beautifully and, you know, like some source was made it or whatever. But here, it's just like exactly what Arya said. It's, it's for people who just can leave without a watch that is at least a few thousand dollars. What if they claim that it's sword resistant? They say no sword can cut this in mm, half. Much Would better. Be more yes. impressed? Except for the rubber strap. Well, it has titanium <laughs> bits in it, so maybe Which is you clearly cut them by sword. Maybe even the strap is sword resistant. Mm. Now you have my attention. They need to start patenting some type of katana mm-hmm. resistance. If if Casio added this 
to the whole list of durabilities in the G-Shock, I think that it would justify is, a price increase. This is just because I've heard Ripley speaking about his love of katanas and he's like, we're making this watch for Ripley. We know someone who's going to buy this. A lot of people like katanas. Come <laughs> on. I, I like katanas and some people like really like katanas. So like that's a whole other thing. <laughs> Welcome to a blog this, to Katana I have a weekly. picture of one of the G-Shock designers holding a katana looking super goofy. <laughs> okay. This is my free BL. <laughs> <laughs> I understand the four hundred pound, the five hundred pound, the full metals, and I understand the seventy grand solid gold ones. I don't understand anything between five or six hundred dollars and the seventy thousand pounds. That that is just uh, I don't I, I don't get I don't why, get why anyone would spend Tudor money or Breitling money or used Omega or whatever on. So here's on a the funny shop. thing. There's someone else out there who cannot understand why for $3,000 you get a mechanical watch. Yeah. It isn't very precise. It doesn't have all these cool functions. It isn't durable like this. And is it going to look the exact same way like 75 years from yeah. now? Yeah, well, those people are clearly wrong and idiots. But other than that, you know, uh, <laughs> come at us. Come at us in the chat. Right, so three and a half grand, three thousand one hundred dollars for a G-Shock. Go and check out the article online. Hi, this is Mark from LongIslandWatch.com. Does my voice sound familiar? You might know me from my YouTube videos. I've been selling watches online since 2001 and have grown to become the first place watch enthusiasts visit when they want to make a purchase. Although my education background is in engineering, I learned all my retail prowess from my father, who was also a business owner and watch lover. Long Island Watch features watches that enthusiasts like you enjoy from a wide variety of brands. Throw in fair pricing and the worry-free ownership that we provide, and you'll see why we have remained a reliable source for watches in the industry. My staff and I have decades of watch knowledge that you will be hard-pressed to find anywhere else. We are enthusiasts first and treat you how you want to be treated. We've got the most desirable models from the big players, such as Seiko, Citizen, and Bulova. But you know the real value lies in the more esoteric brands, such as Marathon, Formex, Islander, Phoebus, Laco, Damasco, and others. So keep in touch until you are ready to get your next timepiece. Could be tomorrow, could be next week. Our best deals are found in our members-only newsletter that you can sign up for today at longislandwatch.com. Thanks for listening. Let's go to the other extreme, the Bell & Ross BR-X5 Green Loom Watch. Who doesn't, like loom? Who doesn't like a bit of loom? Oh, clearly Ariel doesn't like a bit of loom. Ariel, why is your head in your hands? Um, This watch looks very cool only when it's brightly glowing. The rest of the time, it does not look cool. So if you somehow have the ability to make it constantly glow, <laughs> uh -huh. great. Otherwise, I do not understand this watch. So, nightclub dancer. What other? What other? Nightclub dancer. What other lines of an astronomer? Yes, if you're a go-go <laughs> dancer under UV lights all the time, by all means. Astronomer? They work under black light. I don't know. An astronomer. Tanning bed like, operator. You know. Tanning salon Tanning bed, bed <laughs> operator. Yes. Yeah, I'm sure that would be a good one. So, for it. is it a more or less limited market than a three grand G-Shock? a watch that can only be worn under black light. It's a very good question. Maybe like crime scene investigator, CSI, CSI Bell and Ross. It's $10,000 more than the G-Shock. <laughs> <You know, laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> it, it's very expensive. And so that's the thing. I think the novelty of this piece would be really cool if they were able to offer it at like entry level Bell and Ross price where it's like, oh, I've got my cool glowing watch for like, you know, a four figure price point when it's, basically encroaching upon daytona money it's that's that's a totally different purchase and let's be real the glowy stuff is it's some composite so you're getting like a glowy plastic watch for it's fiberglass nobody wants a watch made out of fiberglass <laughs> thirteen thousand dollars <laughs> or thirteen thousand three hundred i believe sorry it's a it's a fun novelty it's good for their pr but let's not pretend this is the next bell and ross we want my question is we've got a picture of it in broad daylight and I think it looks okay in broad daylight, actually. And we've got a picture of it under full loom. Presumably there is a gradation of this looking slightly greener and slightly, you know, as as the sun sets <laughs> and it just looks a bit odd. Mm. You know, it looks great either like in full gansic. sunshine or full blacklight, but in between it just looks muddy. <laughs> like what? It, 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 
It looks like progressively more worrying <laughs> colors <laughs> if it is coming out of your body somehow, okay? Like, yeah. it's not what you want to be thinking <laughs> about on your wrist. It's just, it's... <laughs> <laughs> there actually is too much lube. I never thought I'd say it, but there is too much. Is they found thing. it. They've exceeded the threshold. Congratulations. Maybe you need some little award belt, Ross, but you officially made too Ooh. much of a lube. Maybe <laughs> for you, it's similar enough for me. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> Wear the watch a little bit. We'll see, David. Add some diamonds to it, and David's there. It's his, it's his, one, it's his exit watch. <laughs> The dial itself isn't luminous. I think that might have been a missed opportunity. If you're going to do it, go ahead and do it. Don't give it a... Yes, the, don't, that's the thing. There's no functional reason. We're not like, oh, it's but it's so bright to read. You can't even read I'm parts of it. And the case, case being glowing uh, serves no purpose. Yeah. <laughs> What's funny, though, <laughs> is the fact that there's got all that loom. And I know it's not like a major issue when it would be illuminated, but you can't read the date. <laughs> So what? all that loom, and they didn't put loom on the date wheel, which yeah. you, yeah, you no. would think is like, no, did you forget a bit? It's on the date window, which is funny. That would have made the watch $16,000. That's <laughs> why they give you the uh, the luminous triple date window. You get three chances yes. to see the date. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? If you can identify one of the numbers, then you've got a chance. <laughs> yeah, it's the fact that the window is illuminated, but not the contents Whoever of the window. illuminates a frame for something? That's... It's like, well, why not just make it a door? <laughs> it's, like, it's just a door. It's not a window. because You, can't, like, it's, you see the outline, but no one's in it. Yeah, so, yeah, go and have some fun on the article for the Bell and Ross. I dare say the comment section is something to behold. Yeah, there seems to be quite a lot of comments here. 13 and a half grand yeah. does seem a stretch. And I love Bell and Ross. I think Bell and Ross are great. I, I actually do like this watch. If you had, like... You could buy, like, a fiberglass boat for that much. <laughs> and paint it with black light paint. You probably could actually see it with your Bell and Ross. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, if you have just... If money's just coming out your every orifice that normally would have green stuff coming out of it i want to see the jokes on social media where people do like what you said where they just like paint their watches <laughs> luminous like super okay. luminova that's what happened <laughs> just to, dip it if you get if you did give the 5711 can you imagine giving the 5711 as you said earlier on how soon would we get a fully luminous 5711 if you gave it to pagani or noon or one of these, or even just Bell and Ross. Maybe that's who we should give it to. Let's give the 5711 to Bell and Ross and let them do this with it. <laughs> well, if you want a fully luminous watch, what about the Resin Watch Lab? Uh, we I've reviewed a couple of his pieces. I'm sure yes. he could make you something fully luminous for less than $13,000. So if you want a glowy watch, the whole thing to glow, and you have $13,000 to spend, I'm sure you could contact that guy, and he will make you a bespoke piece for, for less than that. For that, well, yeah, go and, and have a, a look and a consideration of that. We go slightly further upstream now. The new release, the Urwerk UR 100V Light Speed. I'm not sure why it's got then, uh, yeah, it's Light Speed, not comma, Light Speed. It's not an excellent, what is it? Because it, I'm confused. Uh, it's an maybe it's, just a, maybe it's just an aberrant. Yeah, but why is there an apostrophe after it? Lightspeed apostrophe. I think it's watch. supposed to have one before it as well. I don't understand. I, I, I think it's like a quote unquote the light speed. Is what it's supposed is to be. Is it a quote light speed watch? Well, as opposed to just a, a random apostrophe just to confuse yes. us all. So, anyway, we're going to we'll correct the, the copy edit on that uh, later on. But new release from Urwork. Love Urwork. Love this. This has got some loom on it, but this looks like. This looks like it might just be the, the right kind of loom. But I'm guessing that for the price of, you know, what would be $73,000 that you'd expect the loom to be in all the right places. Do we love your work, Ripley? I do. I mean, it's it's kind of one of those, nothing quite looks like those they're, they're, those watches. And if they do, they're kind of copying and one of the Urwerk designs. Um, but yeah, I, I, I like... I like all of these executions. Um, I don't know if this is my favorite one of them, but I, you know, I'm a big fan of the brand across the board. It's like it's literally the watch Iron Man would wear and wore on screen. So you know, I like I love the brand. Cool, David. Oh, I see a developing uh, trend of watches saying anus on them. Uh, this also says. Uh... <laughs> 
This this show is slowly it's taken a hundred episodes <laughs> to go from last week we had balance cocks to now David's <laughs> said it's just degrading. I know. I mean it's, 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 it's stop staying in hotel rooms. But <laughs> well, that's what it said on there. Uh, so you know, I'm I'm already impressed and interested and fascinated. Um, the case bag is absolutely fit. You gonna buy this one and put it alongside your moon swatch then? Oh, uh, maybe. I mean, it's a little two watch collection. It's seven and three thousand. I mean, there are people that collect like you know, there are people that collect dive watches. Yeah. There are people who collect like mm. Digiana watches. There are people who collect vintage watches. David collects watches that say anus on yes. them. So oh. if you've got anyone's other than the moon swatch and this that say that on it, there must be a constant shake in somewhere probably. So you've got a two watch collection currently. I think that's yeah. just the sphere you need to get into, David. Yeah. What do we know David for collecting watches? Well, we know David for this. <laughs> David, the guy at a blog to watch. Oh yeah, he's also the guy you, that collects watches. Well. now, when 20 years from now, when the, Yafe, the anus collection comes up at Christie's, boy, you know, <laughs> there is some keen beating action for that. <laughs> well, thankfully, David's audio just cut it. The internet is censoring David. <laughs> the internet is actually censoring David live. David's audio has crashed just as he's telling us his best Enos joke. Uh, this is too crashed. much for her work to handle. <laughs> ah, there. So, yeah, David, you're just... Uh, Ah, oh, no, the watch brand police is here. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I, I, Alan's been told. So our, our hit miss maybe squad are busy logging in, but they've all to remain silent for just now, so they can't interrupt David and his best Alone, jokes. we might we might design a badge for you to wear next time, just so you know. Why? Because I'm the police. <laughs> I, for the purpose of this comedy, you can okay, be. No, I, I don't want to be. I like You're going to be the uh, the watch brand sensitivity inspector. The, I like how the idea Ario is. Yes. <laughs> I would refuse to be part of the Thank watch. You for the aggressive the watch looking font there. <laughs> That's right. Like, David. It is quite a militant font. <laughs> American <Inspector>. podcast, American <laughs> Army font. Hey. Scottish podcast. More than Get half right. the people here are not <laughs> American. <laughs> but okay. Brand is though. You see, I branded it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Anyway, That's I, nice. Alan will be joining us for Hit Miss maybe shortly. David, continue with your 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 two watch collection of watches that say anus yeah, on them. Yeah, sorry, Alan. <laughs> you're just getting this now. That's your stars from that's where that is. I mean, I have one for daily wear, and you know, just uh, whatever. <laughs> don't forget how many. Yes, yeah, say I know, but I, hate, right? I, I don't like too many of it. But I do need to know Shane is. Well, actually, watches. There'll be a Christian Vanderclaw as well. Somewhere. I think this might say something about, or, you know, I like Ulrich a lot, I, but they've clearly exhausted this design. If they can produce something in thin ply carbon with, you know, an, an exotic complication, and the first thing that David's going to notice about it goes, it ah, says it. anus on it. <laughs> like, if, 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 they, if that's where we're at, you know, may, maybe they might need a new case silhouette. <laughs> The man is bored the of life. That's all you need to put on the dial to get him to buy it. It could be a terrible yeah. watch. It just says that somewhere, and he will pay top dollars. So your planetary watch geeks, if you yeah, just put the solar system on the watch. David's guaranteed to buy it. So yeah, <laughs> uh, crack on there. Okay, we'll do we'll do one more before we go on to hit miss. Maybe the one more we're going to do is actually uh, another watch from Casio. This is a limited edition Casio Casotron. Casotron? Casotron? TRN50 2A watch, 50 years of watchmaking. If you were celebrating 50 years of watchmaking, would this be the watch you brought back, Ariel? What do you think of the Casotron? Is that the way you pronounce it? Yeah, Casiotron. Well, this is the first wristwatch that uh, Casio ever made in uh, 1974, I believe. This was nine years prior to them coming out with the G-Shock in 1983. And they made a very small number of these um, calculation machine machines. Tron actually just means tool, so this was the Casio tool. And actually doing the calculation of the calendar was quite innovative. Um, we have the updated model plus the original in that we're going to be shooting together. Um, this is an interesting price point because it's it's similar to the GMB um, uh, 5000 uh, sort of uh, more square watch collection. Uh, it's a little bit cheaper. Um, doesn't have a sapphire crystal, has a mineral crystal, which is actually, that actually, actually probably 
alone that allows it to reduce the price. And it has the silhouette of this original Cassiotron, but it's got a you know it's got a new movement with Bluetooth and stuff like that. Um, so this is just them trying to do kind of a vintage re-release. That's very much what this is with some. It's a, it's bigger than the original and. Um, Again, it has more modern the modern technology in it, but it's it's actually a fun piece, and um, you know uh, we I, again I'm very lucky that that Casio sent like a bunch of their vintage watches, and this is even more more on top of the the G Shocks, and so that's what's interesting about it. this represents sort of their non G Shock world. So uh, we have like fifty not mostly non G Shock Casios. There's a few G Shocks in there um, mm -hmm. that that do all these gadgety things, and I think that that's one of the areas that Casio is not, it's appreciated by those who know, but it's not spoken about for being an innovator. I mean, we wouldn't have uh, the, the sort of digital calendar watch as we know it if it wasn't for some of the seminal stuff they did. Um, so that's that's what the original was, and that's what this re-release is. Ripley, this for $500 or the three grand Mr. G from earlier on? Uh, this for 500 bucks all day long. I love Casio's non G-Shock lines. Um, you know, the G-Shock's been such a runaway success for them that for, you know, since it came out, they've given it so much attention that they've kind of neglected some of their these other lines. Now, obviously, the Pro Trek has got has probably the only other one that I can think of off of the top of my head other than the Oceanus. But like, you know, they have these other lines of watches and then they have these core collection ones that we never even get press releases about. They just sort of like show up on the website. They retail for $20. So it doesn't make sense to put together like marketing materials, you know, for these things. But um, I, I love that these, I find these site like non G shock, non, you know, collection models of Casio fascinating. So I love that they've done this one um to a really high level but not so ludicrously priced that like it's you know now five thousand dollars you know I, I i think this is a really cool piece i do wish the crystal was sapphire but you know i'd i'd buy this all day long yeah there's always the mrg version for that <laughs> for 7, <000. laughs> the mr casiotron <laughs> mr casiotron <laughs> David, do you fancy a Mr. Casio Tron? That too, but also this one for 500. I am, I am looking at a picture of the original 1974 and this one 50 years later. And the original does have this vintage charm a little bit that takes me back because you always see the hours and the minutes. Um, so no seconds. So it has this different type of display. And given that they've only made 4,000 of these for the anniversary for whatever reason, um, I feel like they could have um, stayed a little bit closer uh, to the original design to um, to keep that vintage charm and 70s digital watch kind of wide. But overall, good proportions, looks straight. Um, you know, yeah, sure, why not? I'm, I'm happy that it's here, and I'm super, super, super jealous that Aria gets to play with all that, all those like big boxes of vintage Casio watches. They send me a few pictures, it's like 50 of them in there. Uh, that is a once in a lifetime opportunity this, uh, to see all these amazing creations by Casio from uh, the past uh, century. So that's amazing. I'm looking forward to the article on that. Good, good. I we're gonna start playing Hit Miss maybe uh, shortly. But seeing as Alan is already on, what do you think of this Casio, Alan? I actually love it. I had it in my hands two days ago because I visited the Inhorgenta Watch Fair Munich. Casio Europe runs out of Germany. So I met up with the European CEO. He once invited me to Japan, so fond memories. I've seen the real one in the museum in Japan, had it in my hands. It has a beautiful effect on the dial, because if you remember the silicon marquetry by Ulysse Nardin, the, the blast they launched at Geneva Watch Days. So it gives you that effect. So I actually thought they put a silicon slice on the dial just for beauty, but it's actually a solar panel. So it, it gives energy to the movement. I am a Casio fan, not in 1983. As a four-year-old kid, I started off with Casio, G-Shock. So I love it. Great stuff. Right. Well, for those of you who are listening to the podcast, please obviously continue listening. You will hear... Uh, some of the hit miss maybe uh, for those who want to hear some added extras because you'll probably hear two on the podcast uh, but you'll see four on the video then do go to a blog to watch live on youtube and you'll be able to see the other two watches that we discuss so let's let everybody into the room 
Okay, we are joined by one, two, three. We are waiting on uh, an Irishman who's probably sitting still uh, reviewing wine for anyone that follows Leslie. David has left us, however, uh, for the rest of the show. But let's go round who we have currently got, see who they are, where they are, and what are they wearing. So first up, Alon, who are you? Where are you? What are you wearing on the wrist? Good morning, Aloma Joseph, calling in from Amsterdam. I am wearing a Dutch watch for my first ever block to watch weekly. It's the Stariadne, which I was honored and proud to work on together with Pim Kuslach, the new owner and CEO of the Dutch watch rent mm. Christian van der Klauw. And it's based on the Ariadne because we added stars on it. We call it the Stariadne. Big fan of Christian van der Klaub, big fan of this watch. It really is stunning. You do need to go and check out the YouTube channel to see what this is like. And where are you calling in from this morning, Alan? Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Amsterdam, great stuff. Right next on my screen, young William. Where are you calling in from and what are you wearing? <laughs> uh, good morning, Rick, and good morning, everybody. Um, Alan, that's an absolutely stunning, absolutely stunning watch. Um, <laughs> thank you for sharing that with us. Um, uh, good morning. I'm, I'm uh, calling in from Kent in the UK. And um, this morning, um, you'll have a picture of it, but I'm wearing the uh, slightly more boring and slightly more utilitarian uh, Seiko Prospects Turtle Paddy Pepsi, just a number of words there, <laughs> um, uh, watch, uh, which is kind of my daily beta watch. It's rugged and it makes me imagine that I'm diving somewhere other than uh, the local swimming pool. Uh, so, yeah, there it is. Um, uh, take, that's a photo taken in uh, Brighton on the seaside in the UK. Very nice. Is, um, very nice. Kevin, you have joined us this morning. Uh, where are you and what are you wearing? Morning, gentlemen. I'm also based in uh, in Kent at the moment, and I'm wearing a Grand Seiko uh, Spring Drive uh, GMT uh, from their 24-hour collection. Uh, oh, sorry, autumn, winter, spring and summer. I think this is autumn, but I could be wrong. And, and when you look at this Grand Seiko Spring Drive dial, what part of London does it make you think of? Uh, it's, well, it's supposed to be make make me think of Japan, but <laughs> unfortunately, it, it is a textured dial. But they're so hard to photograph properly; it, it's next to impossible to see. You have to see one of these in the flesh. They are stunning; they really are. Let's crack on. Leslie is here in spirit. He may be uh, doing a rip with this week and be in a cave in Dublin somewhere. Who knows? But let's play Hitmas maybe with who we have. So first up this week is the Trasca Venturer GMT. Let's have a look at what this looks like. Here we are, hands-on Trasca Venturer GMT watch. Uh, gentlemen, you can see on the screen, it's a GMT, it's a watch, it's got a white dial, it's made by Trasca. What more is there to say? Other than, is this a hit, a miss, or a maybe? So on the count of three, tell me what it is. Hit, miss, maybe. Go. Maybe, maybe, hit, hit, maybe. For some reason, my screen is showing the other way around, back to front. Ariel's punching the screen as a maybe, no, I no, assume. No, no, that's my, that's my maybe, yeah. Oh. So this is my Yes, hit. that's, that's your maybe. So tell us, Ariel, why it is a maybe. <laughs> it's a perfectly good watch at a decent price, but for someone like me, I just don't know when I would wear it. And that's actually the issue now. There's like, at a certain phase of collecting, I'm sure others <laughs> others on this call the same way, you just recognize you're like, I don't know when I'd wear it. I have plenty of white dialed. I have plenty of watches on bracelets. I have plenty of GMTs. So for someone brand new coming into this that hasn't had these features yet, I, I can see it being great. But for a mature collector, I just I, there's no holes in my collection that it fills. Hmm. Ripley? Oh, it, I mean, it's a hit for me. I, I wrote the article. Um so there is more to say. It's a uh, Mio to nine zero seven five. So you got the ad independently adjustable local hour hand. They've hardened the whole case and bracelet, which is kind of nice to do. They've even decorated the clasp with perlage. You got a, a, a nice extension in there. And rather than opting for the obvious layout of a GMT with an external rotating bezel, they've put that on the inside, so you get a bit more of a dressy appearance. Um, and without you know having this almost extraneous thing if you print it on the on the dial so i think it's great and then you also have to look at what it 
it's offering at its price point relative to other watches that use the same movement. It's really on the lower side for watches that are using that Miyota 9075 GMT. So it's a hit all day long. Um, I think it's a really compelling option for someone who's kind of looking for this type of watch. But like Ariel said, if this isn't the one that speaks with you, there are other very similar watches that can, will do the similar thing for a comparable price. Yeah, I was a maybe for the reasons Ari was given, which is I just don't know. It's, it's lovely, but it, it's no lovelier than any other GMT watch that I may or may not already own. Alon, would you be purchasing this? I gave it a hit for several reasons. First of all, thank you, Block to Watch. That's why I love a Block to Watch so much, and I read it from day one. I've never heard about Tresca. So I was very happy to discover this watch on your blog. Compliments, Ripley, well written. I went to their website after reading this blog and then I got a bit of OP vibes, right? Oyster Perpetuals. But on the website, they literally make copycats. Those I would have never bought. This one is an evolution of it. I like that it's a GMT. It has an extra crown at the 10 o'clock position. When would I wear this? Is in Europe and in Amsterdam, you get ripped for your Rolexes, right? No pun intended, Ripley. (laughs) So... (laughs) <laughs> I would wear when I'm traveling or going out and about where I want a dressed down toolish watch, a bit elegant, maybe suited up or casual, but don't want to get ripped for my Rolex. So that's maybe how I would buy. But I have two hats on, right? As a retailer, this is a lot of bang for your buck. And this is a great entry watch if you want to experience an OP, if you're on the fence to buy one or if you simply can't afford one yet. Will, are you buying one of these to hide the Rolex you're wearing on the other wrist? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I viewed it as a hit, um, mainly for the uh, for the reasons that uh, Alon uh, gave. Um, I hadn't come across this brand um, either before, but I think the price point is is absolutely perfect for this type of watch. So it's kind of it is a bit like an Oyster Perpetual Junior in a way, if you could say that. Um, it reminds me a bit of the white uh, dialed um, Milgauss, um, which um, is a good thing because that's a, that's a very beautiful watch. Um, it's a great daily wearer. Um, I appreciate if you have a more sophisticated collection, you're going to struggle to put this somewhere unless it becomes a so-called beta watch that you want that's generally um, acceptable in different situations between jeans and a t-shirt and, you know, maybe a suit. Um, but I, um, I really like it. It's quite charming. Um, and, um, I was, yeah, also looking at it and thinking, "Hmm, maybe I should, I'm not sure if I I should, I should get this or not because yeah, London has that issue where you just can't wear your Rolex and a lot of places you really can't wear your Rolex outside anymore. Um, and, um, so this, this kind of deals with that issue, I think. Great stuff, Leslie. What do you reckon to this? Yes, yeah, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. I reloaded it and it all came back. So uh, <laughs> if, if in doubt, turn it off and turn it on again. Um, yeah, I like it. Well, for the price, I mean, I wouldn't be paying much more than that. But yeah, it's nice. It's pretty. I would. I mean, it's seven hundred and twenty bucks. I suppose. Yeah. If, yeah I may. I may be persuaded to do a will and change from a maybe to a hit just because of the price. <laughs> Flip flopping. Flip flopping. I know it's terrible. You're just a bad influence. Kevin, are you there? I'm here. I've turned off my video, so I'm going to keep this brief. I'm coming in on out. Uh, I'll put it as a maybe, and um, basically just reiterating what you, Ricky, and Ariel said. It's a great watch, but it won't fit in my collection at this moment in time. I've got other similar things. And, you know, it's it's a great price point. It's a great price point. So mm. whoever's after a decent, good quality watch, you can't go wrong with it, but it's just not for me. Good stuff. Right, well, do go to the Blog to Watch website and give us your opinion. You can go to the bottom of the page and give it your own hit miss, maybe. Uh, next up, something a bit different. The Rado Retro Futuristic Anatom. Okay, there's not a lot you need to say about this watch. It's square and it's green or it's blue and it's probably fully made of ceramic and it's a Rado. What else do you need to know? It's automatic. It's got a date window. It's six o'clock. It has some loom on it, which if you listen to the earlier part of the show, you will know we are big fans of. But the question is, is this a hit, a miss, or a maybe from our guests? So on the count of three, tell us, is it a hit, a miss, or a maybe? One, two, three, go. 
We have a hit, a maybe, some misses, some hits. I think broadly a hit. We'll see what Leslie says, because Leslie is apparently experiencing connectivity issues, but you can probably get some medicine for that. So let's see what it is. Ariel, you gave it a maybe. Why did you give it a maybe? Well, the design has not aged for me as maybe well as Rada would have liked. The case is amazing. Um, I think that they can do some different things with the dial. Um, the reason I like it is this is ceramic story, how Rado was really the innovator there and, you know, others, you know, went further with it, but I like the ceramic story a lot and I like what they were doing at the time. Um, but for me, as much as I want to like, I like the geometry of it and there's a lot of things like that for some reason it just leaves me cold enough that I don't know that I would choose it that often. So maybe because there's a lot of things I like about it, um, but I don't know. I think that there's maybe things that they can do to, to spruce it up a little bit. Um, but they have other models that, that I like a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Ripley, where did this figure in your estimations? Yeah, it's a maybe for me. I'm, there's a lot I like about it, but it isn't my favorite Rado. I, I, I like the ceramic uh, that they do that and you know that they've kind of have their own sort of it, it, it's true to the brand, but they also kind of push the envelope with it. Um, my first boss out of college had a ceramic Rado on a bracelet that he wore frequently along with the Bell and Ross. He liked the rectangular ones clearly. Um, but <laughs> I'm you know, for, for me, like it, the, the simple thing is I, there's a lot I like about it. I'd happily wear it, but this isn't necessarily the Rado that I would buy for myself. So you know, it's a maybe for me, you know, if it speaks to you, fantastic. I don't have anything bad to say about it, but it's just not unique enough to the point where it's the one that I'd be reaching for my money with. See, I thought this was a hit just because I think it's one of these watches that does come across as quite unique. These kind of bracelet rattles, you know, completely unsuitable to wear, but really attracted me through the shop window like got me in to look at other stuff because they just look so different i did try on a couple of the the the, the bracelet ones in the past and yeah I, i'm not i'm not huggy bear out of what was huggy bear in what show was huggy bear in not smoking Starsky the band hutch. Starsky and hutch yeah i'm not huggy bear so this wasn't gonna work for me but there we go alon did this work for you this was a miss for me, a triple miss. I love Rado. Triple miss. Triple miss. <laughs> I, I love he Rado. He comes on the show. It's his first time here already. He's inventing different scales. <laughs> so, so triple miss, why? I love Rado. I love the anatom. And they missed out three times why. I would have never done the fumé, the, the smoky gradient on this version because it's a round gradient on a squarish case. Besides, I wouldn't have done green because it doesn't really go with the black gray tones. Then I this needs, it begs a ceramic bracelet. The rubber, the, the, the matte rubber with the shiny beauty of the ceramic. And Rado is infamous, famous. It's, it's, it's innovative, legendary for ceramic. And they've been missing, they've been dropping the ball and, and they gave away the ceramic game to others. It's time for them to step up, pick it up again. They could have done it. They should have do it. And the, the third thing is I, 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 God knows why they put a titanium or a steel bar that connects the rubber to the case. So that's the triple miss for me. Sorry, Rado, I know you can do it. Please do it. These are good points. Yeah, well, uh, that's why we brought them on here. Somebody had to be giving some good points in this show. We're importing them in. Uh, Will, can, <laughs> do you have a good point to make? Um, I don't know. I mean, the pressure's on now, isn't it? Um, I, 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 just tell us it's a hit, a miss, I and a maybe. Hit. That'll do, just, you know, flip-flop. Uh, mine is a hit. Mine's a double hit. <laughs> no, I'm... I'm a, um, my, mine's, uh, my, mine's a hit for actually the reasons that perhaps uh, have been... Uh, that people are critical of it. Um, it's purely ACs for me. I mean, like, everybody I can't... Well, I mean... I, I grew up in the 80s. I grew up in uh, northeast of England, which is very dark, very grim. And one of the only things that was sunshine and sunlight for me was either swatch watches 
or it was actually seeing uh, the Rado adverts um, in magazines, because to me that spoke to a European glamour and style. And it was people skiing, it was people yachting, mm-hmm. it was all of these very glamorous things. And the ceramic was obviously still was futuristic, and it still comes off as futuristic now. And I still really, really like the uh, the design um, the design of it. Um, uh, I think that um, obviously it hasn't particularly moved on massively in my view anyway from what it from what it used to be but i think that's really that's really good um i'd say uh, as alon said i mean um take back the ceramic take back your position <laughs> rado um I, I, th- I think it's I think it's great. So for me, it was a it was a hit. I liked the green. It was just a bit mysterious. Um, it wasn't a lighter, toxic green color. It was just a darker, quite classy green color. And it's something that if you wear it on your wrist, I think everybody will stop and stare and ask you about, um, which is surely what watch collecting is all about, making friends. Yes. I just want to make more friends. Yes. So perhaps I need to buy this watch. Well, it's lonely. Uh, the- <laughs> I do think we need to stop and explore for a minute the idea of Baby Will on the coal fields of Middlesbrough. Uh, uh, Will, you strike me as a man who was born and brought up in the northeast, but maybe was schooled in the southeast. Uh, so I-, I want to hear the Newcastle accent. Can you do it? Put my scuba. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you if you take if you if you take me north of say Watford, then obviously the, the Geordie accent comes like, back. Excellent. Um, I, I've I've yeah, I've loved yeah, it. So, yes, yeah. they always say that if you say poop, we'll save that for a blog to watch special bl- edition. After where I, dark, yeah, we'll, break into we'll, Geordie. Will turns yeah. full Geordie. Right? Okay. Exactly. <laughs> Kevin, a blog to watch U- UK accent edition. Yes, yes, we're going to do. Uh, I'm determined that we're yeah. going to do a show with an Englishman, an Irishman, and a Scotsman, uh, and that will be our, our, our new format eventually. We, exactly, we'll do it from I'll be, the live shows. Will be from a bar, and it'll feature the three of us. Right, uh, Kevin, are you there? I'm here. Yes. Um, do you do I any good accents? Unfortunately, not. No, no I'm just your born own. and bred in London, so we don't do accents. Everybody copies <laughs> us, you know. We're, we're the centre of the universe, coming us Londoners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Take to your <laughs> Leslie. What did you think? No, go on, Kevin. I, <laughs> no, I thought it was a hit. So <laughs> you give it a hit, Kevin. Good stuff. I gave it a hit. And, and, um, and a hit for me. Yeah, and a hit from Wesley Can I, as well. I just think- very quickly, it reminds me of a, the second watch I ever bought, which was a Rado Voyager from the 1970s. I paid about $50 on, on eBay. Uh, and it had that same tapering thing and the same bit of steel and so on. I, I sold it to somebody for, well, I got it serviced and then realized I wasn't wearing it and I sold it for the price of the service. Um, so I do miss it. But it reminded me of that and I thought it was, I thought it was really pretty. Uh-huh. And yeah, you know, Ben's, Ben's comments are exactly accurate, but I still liked it. Rado, not holding its value since the 1880s. Right, next yes. we are on to, well, next we're on to just what's going to be on YouTube. So if you're listening on the podcast, we'll see you in a moment for the goodbyes. But if you want to, you can go to the YouTube channel and you'll be able to hear thoughts on the Omega Constellation and a Breitling Navi Timer. So jump over to the YouTube channel, a blog to watch weekly live if you want to tune into that. It's an apocalypse watch. Well, we started the, we started the show, I think, talking about apocalypses in the watch industry. Maybe Breitling will be the one that survives them all. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for coming on the show today. Thank you, Alan, for being the hit miss maybe virgin today. We will hopefully see many, if not all of you, again next week. So eh, it's goodbye for me and it's goodbye from all of them. Wave goodbye and say goodbye. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.